right, everyone? So week seven of the class is here. And remember, the summer basically is nine weeks long. So we're getting very close to the end of things. I did the grading of those that, of you that turned in the week five. Those have been graded. And um, this week, we've got new things to learn plus another assignment. Now, again, if you look at things, um, the calendar and so forth, the class uh, ends on the uh, first week of August. Uh, so officially, August 1st, which is a Thursday, which is weird. But we're still going to have um, the time for you to turn in things um, but most likely it'll be on uh, August 4th, which is a Sunday. This whole semester, and back on part one, everything was being due on Tuesday uh, of the following week. But for the final project that is coming eventually, uh, we're not going to be able to have the deadline of, you know, uh, Tuesday, August 6th. It's going to be the deadline of Sunday, August 4th. So I will repeat that, of course, but start to plan that August 4th, Sunday, is the end of the class. Now, we haven't finished the class, but I'm just telling you what to look forward in the future. Because today, this week, July 15th, the week of July 15th, we have the Monday and Wednesday. And we've got another assignment, week seven, the second code check-in. That'll be due on the 23rd. So we'll have these Tuesday deadlines until the final. And so I will show you there in a moment on the welcome um, that everything up to the week six is what you need to be able to do and complete and apply to your project. Week seven, what we're learning this week in a sense, will be optional. But if you want to add this to your final project, you could. But it'll be the more complex thing that we do this summer. So everything of this week will be optional. Next week, we will be final wrap-up polish of the project. And then the final project will be assigned. Then the week of the 29th, it's just going to be final lab time. So Monday the 29th and uh, Wednesday the 31st will only be lab time. It will not be any new material. It'll just be come to the class, work on your project, because it's going to be due, the final project, by Sunday the 4th. Now I plan next week as well, probably Wednesday the 24th will be a complete day of lab time as well. So no lecture then and it's just time to work. The 22nd, that Monday, will probably be a little bit, maybe an hour at the most, the final polish on the project, and then lab time. So up to week six, which was last week, is what will be required for the final, and I'll give the details of the final as time goes by. But basically, obviously, your project needs to be complete, and it needs to work, and it needs to have your graphics and your characters and music and such. This week will be extra credit sort of things. Next week will be final polish and lab time. And then in two weeks, final lab time, because the final is will be due on the 4th. Now, those of you, the four of you that come here in person, continue to do so to get your work done, to ask questions, to make sure that it works. Because as you've been seeing by the grades and such, the focus of grading is, does it work? And it's too mean to say it, but I'll say it. I don't care how it looks. I care that it works. If you've got stick figures, but all your code works, great. You're going to get a good grade. Uh, if you spent all your time on the graphics working and the animation being smooth and nothing works, that's an F. That sounds harsh, but I have to say it that way. Uh, this part of the class, part two of the sequence of things is the focus on the code is the focus on the project working. It's not working if I have to open your 
your file in animate and go to your various screens and look at it like this. That's not working. It works when I debug it or when I run it and I actually click and use it or when I test on the final that it works on a real device. I'm going to expect that your project loads on my device and that it works, that I tap on things and that it works. I don't care how nice it looks. That's not the focus of things. So that is to say, that's why we're going to have lots of lab time for you to make sure that it works by the end. Next week is basically two and a half days of lab time. Two weeks after that will be a complete week of lab time. Do not waste your time and wait until the end and get a bad grade. Um, you're gonna. I, I won't have any sympathy for you when the time comes to give gr final grades and you don't get a final grade. Yeah, your graphics might have been amazing, but the focus is that the code works. Now, obviously, I would prefer that your code works and that your graphics look nice, but I'm going to focus on, of course, all of the coding as we've been doing this whole semester. So do not be putting it off. For those of you that didn't do the week five, you are really behind. If you didn't do the week five assignment, I'll still take it. And I highly recommend you do it. But you are very behind if you didn't turn in the week five assignment. I know several of you come to class via Zoom and don't do the work, which is weird. And uh, so do the work and turn it in because you're going to fail the class. This week, we've got the extra credit to learn. But then there's an assignment, the second code check-in, which I'll explain in a moment. That'll be due next week, Tuesday. Make sure you do it. Every assignment matters. You're going to easily fail this class, even though you feel you did a lot of work. If you don't literally do the work, you're going to fail the class. There's not a lot of assignments in this class. I think there's four or five assignments in this class. Every one of them matters. So make sure you do them all. If you missed week five, do it. Turn it in. Get some amount of points instead of zero. Zero points is very bad. Even if you get, you know, nine out of 15, that's much better than zero out of 15. And wherever I sprinkle in the extra credit, do that too. But don't expect the extra credit to save you. It's extra credit. Make sure you're doing the assignments. So the assignment for this week, the second code check-in. It's the same as the week five check-in you're going to add stuff to your project that we've previously learned. Specifically here, the second code check-in is a focus on what we learned on the coding of week five. Back when we did the week five concepts, now you're going to apply them to your project. Last week's work, spoiler alert, that's going to be eventually applied to the final. See how we're working with the assignment like one one week behind, just so that you have time to work. But this particular assignment for due the uh, uh, on Tuesday, so you're going to make a copy of your project, call it week seven. You're going to start to add the material of what we previously learned, branching paths. So at least moving to two different screens from one screen, like the hallway. Yeah, we did that a while ago. Now you need to apply it to your project. Uh, some of you on the homework that I saw that I graded, some of you already started to do that. That's good. So at least one branching path. That's easy. Okay, the boss countdown, the mini boss countdown with hit points and all of that that we did a while ago. You need to add it to your project now. Some kind of mini boss that you have some kind of time limit to um, defeat within time. Related to that was the other path of randomly generated on-screen items with a time limit that you have to select in time. You need to add that to your project. And then the game over screens. You got those game over screens. Restart the game or exit the game. So all of those things that we've done on the previous weeks, that's the assignment for this week. Do next week. Notice it's not mentioning here anything about music and whatever we learned last week. Well, that's going to be eventually for the final. So this is the assignment for this week. Add what we've learned on those previous weeks. 15 points due on Tuesday. There's the breakdown, what you need to do. It's everything that we did in class. And of course, it's all recorded. 
basically you go back to week five, watch the recording. And if you need a little hint, well, again, on the week five live session, I have my example code of all of it working. That 703 basically has the answers. Obviously, it's in my file, not your file. So somehow you have to get that from my file into your file. Or I would prefer you're watching the lecture and you're doing the things of the lecture on your project. And therefore, you will fulfill the requirements of the final. Now, there is slightly, if you are nitpicking, technically, the part about the game over screen, restart, replay. Technically, we did that last week. So, okay, go to the week six recording and go, and go remind yourself, how did we do the part about restart the game or exit the game? But mostly, it's from the week five, branching paths, mini boss, time limit, random keys generating on screen, time limit thing. All of it's there. It's not a surprise. You might be struggling with details of the code, but it's all there in terms of every week. The whole recording is there and the example code is there. So worst case scenario, if you feel you're utterly falling behind and can't catch up, you can still catch up. Worst case scenario, take my file, which works, and then start to change all of the things so that it's your file. Put your pictures into it, your graphics, your material, because my code works. You saw it in class. That's the worst case scenario. You should be adding the code to your project as time goes on. It's not a surprise. But there's the final safety net that my code is there for you to compare. So for this particular week's assignment, those are the details. There's a little mistake there. That's not week 35. Let me fix that. So um, you want to want to uh, make sure your project works because it's going to be the focus on your code working, not the visuals of it. We've graduated beyond visuals a while ago. It's about the code working. If it doesn't work, it's a bad grade. That's it. There's no way around it. Just like computers are very black and white, your code works or not. On my grading, I do have nuance in grading, but basically do the thing and you get the points. If you didn't do the thing, you get you don't get points. I don't care how nice it was animated and how amazing your your graphics are. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Imagine that in a in a job. You know, never mind a classroom. Oh, I got a bad grade in a in a in an assignment. Never mind about that. In the real life, you do a bad job at work, you don't get a bad grade at work, you get fired. Can't pay the rent. So it is harsh and all of that, but at least here in a school environment, um, you hopefully learn the tactics of managing your time, asking for help, getting the work done so that when you're out in the real world, you can apply those things, managing your time, asking for help. So this particular week is adding the uh, inventory. Uh, finishing up the inventory and management system and then character select. So we started to set up the inventory management a little while ago and we left it dangling at a certain point. I wanted to do other things that were more important, but now we can get back to the inventory. So here's how inventory is going to work. Um, we're going to have in the hallway of the right... We're going to add another branching path over here. But that door can only be opened if you've got the key. So on the little mini boss here, if you defeat the mini boss, now you have the time to go through the alternate route where we'll have an alternate path here, which requires a key. You're battling the boss, you don't have time to worry about it, so you have to defeat the boss. Once you do so, then you can either go through the obvious path or the hidden path. And that's going to be based on the key. Remember, the key was back on the main hallway here. After the, um, after the painting falls down, you can pick up the key. This is an optional path. If a person never finds that key, they never get it into their inventory and they are never able to go through the alternate route. That's fine. It's a 
It's a side quest. It's not required for the game. We started to set that up way back on scene one, behind the scenes, in the code, by having the... Um, by having a section here of, um, set up inventory system variables. In my case, it was line 9B, but I started to set up something eventually. Okay, inventory item, the key, the skull key, the inventory item, the key, the flame key, the inventory item, the diamond armor or whatever. And the idea was that we've got an item, true or false. Behind the scenes, inventory items work basically true or false. You have it or not. Obviously, visually is another matter, which we'll get to, of course. But by setting up a way to keep track, do you have the item? False. You haven't picked it up. Then we added on the hallway, once the painting falls down, you see the, the skull key on screen and you tap it, we flip that from false to true. Now we have it. Okay, we have the inventory item. Cool. We didn't have anything visually yet representing that. We'll add that today. And now that we've got that variable set to true floating around in memory, when we get to the hallway of right, that alternate path, and we try to open the door, if we never had the key, it doesn't let us proceed. If we did have the key, it does let us proceed. That's a conditional statement. On the condition of key equals true, let me go forward. On the condition of key equals false, do not let me go forward. See how that's building up together. So we've got the visual parts, and then we've got the code parts. Let's do the visual parts first, then the code parts. On the right hallway, we're going to add another path, an alternate path. Um, and that alternate path needs the key. Now, to make it really fun and fancy, this alternate path is going gonna, is gonna to be a, a door, but the door has like wooden planks blocking it. And then when we defeat the boss, it was such an epic battle that the room shakes and that the planks fall off. All right, so the planks fell off the door. Now let me open the door. Do I have the key? So I'm going to draw a door here with planks covering it up that I cannot proceed yet. Then when we defeat the boss, the planks will fall off. Then I could try to open the, the door. So the way we'll set that up. Um, on the layer of interact... I'm going to draw a brand new door here. Here. The way I want to do it, as I said, it's going to be boarded up and then the boards will fall off. Now imagine, let's say it was covered in rocks and then knock the rocks out of the way to try to open the, the door. Or let's say there's a door and then there's a bookshelf in the way and somehow the bookshelf moves out of the way and then I could go into the door, whatever way you want to do it. I'll start setting this up as just a square and I'm going to turn it into a symbol, then I'm going to finish drawing it, then it needs an instance name, then it needs the code. So I'm going to start to draw the door. I'm going to turn it into the symbol right away. Sprite. What do I want to call this? Sprite, right? Uh, right, sprite hallway key. Uh, call this sprite call right door or secret door, hidden door. Let's see, sprite call right secret door. So uh, I want to turn it into a symbol as soon as possible because then the cool thing is that I could then further edit it a lot easier. When it's a symbol in its own timeline, I can um, 
further edit it as much as I want. Double click it on the, on the main screen here so I can focus on it. Everything else will fade out. I will focus on editing it. If you double click it to edit it in the timeline, everything else gets removed and then you can't quite tell how am I setting it up? I can't see my scene. So I would recommend instead um, on the actual scene there where you just created the empty square, from there, double click it to edit it. And the editing will be, okay, I'll set up, I don't know, door and planks. The planks are gonna change. The planks are gonna fall off. The door, I guess I could animate the door when it opens, but I want the door on its own layer and then planks on its own layer. There's gonna be a door right here, planks. So wooden planks, you know, the details later. Uh, we will do some planks. Obviously, I'll stress about making this perfect later. Be good enough here. So, got some planks covering the door. Obviously, I cannot get into that door first or yet until those planks fall off. The planks will fall off once the uh, once I defeat the mini boss. But just for some, um, you know, style here, there's some planks. Um. happen is that the uh, the boss gets defeated, then the planks fall off, then you're able to try to open the door. So this is going to look something like this. alternate path. If a person never goes through that path, that's fine. It'll give them a sense of, okay, next time I play the game, I want to try to get through that alternate path. So this is enticing them a lot. There's something else there. After we defeat the boss, the planks will fall off. So I'll do some quick animation of the planks falling off. Um, I'll do this very simply, animating in twos. Uh, so on the on its own layer of own layer of the um, planks. The planks are on, then I'm going to animate them falling off. So what does that even look like? It's going to be just, you know, in my case, three planks just flying off. Yeah. I'm going to draw them better later. The idea is that um, It's even better if I'm using onion skinning so I can see how I drew them. Some amount of frames. Well. Properly later. Because again, the focus of things is that the um, code works, not that the animation is so smooth and all of that. That's nice, but the part that um, I will care about more is that the code works. For the moment, that's good enough. Now, obviously, we know that this is going to uh, auto-play if we don't uh, add our code. So I'm going to need a uh, frame one stop command and then a frame, in my case, frame 10 stop command. After, before we break off the 
planks. We need to stop the animation. And then after we break off the planks, we need to stop animation or else they'll keep um, they'll keep animating. Action script layer so that I can stop. First frame and then a blank keyframe on the final frame. Actions layer. particular scene, the um, alternate path here. Starting to set that up. I can polish up all the animation later, but the point is that that will be another path to take if you've got the key. What we forget here, this needs an instance name so that the code can reference it. I'm trying to open the door, but we need to check, do we have the key? Yes, go forward, no. Stay here, say a message, do a sound, do something. But this needs an instance name. I'll give it an instance name while I'm here. So hallway right secret door. Any instance name will work. Okay, so um, the inventory um, usage then here um, will make the visual part of it in a moment. But what we can do here is set up the event listener to try to open the door and then code to first check, do you have the key or not? So after I've made that door with code of the main timeline here of this right scene, right hallway. We already have some code about, okay, go to the main doorway to go to the exit. We're going to need then um, the event listener and such for that uh, secret door. And paste a little bit of the code here so far. I need uh, instance name, event listener, and then the function defining it. So to save a little bit of effort, I can copy what I've already got there about the regular door, copy that and paste it. And I need to change some things, of course. Make sure to add the ending curly brace. Change this, of course. This, of course. This, of course, and this. We've done that several times. It's nothing new something to interact with and with some code. So the something is the brand new door that I just made. So it's instance name. It's to save some effort. Okay. We're going to run some function. We'll say function secret one. Find here, which we have our usual trace, which then we have our ending note, so we don't lose track of that curly brace. This will be relatively easy. It's just the idea of having the inventory item. Inventory items, as I've said already, uh, there's two parts to it. One is visually, oh, I picked up the key and I see it in my in my bag of holding. Okay, so there's the visual part of it. Then there's the maybe more important part, the behind the scenes part, which is the code. So here we'll say uh, 
before opening the door, check if we have the skull key. That's going to be an if else. If you have the key true or else you don't, false. So that we've seen if else a couple of times before making decisions. For readability, I'll break down this curly brace to its own line. This curly brace, its own line. Make myself a note that this is the end of my if else um, skull key checker. This first section here will be true. You can trace true. We have the skull key and all of the code necessary there versus trace false. Don't have. have the skull key yet. So we may think it's a very complex thing, but for for the computer, for the programming language, we can break it down very easily. True or false, do you have this or not? And what we have here is, okay, there's two ways to do this. We can have, you know, skull key equals true. That makes a lot of sense. Um, sh I'll show you an alternate way. The alternate way is more efficient, but maybe the longer way it makes more sense for a beginner. Um, so spell that properly. Uh, that was back on the, where did we set that up on the title? Yeah, right here. So in the skull key in the beginning when the game starts is equal to false. When we go to the main hallway and we pick up the skull key in the key skull becomes true. And now that we're in the right hallway, we're gonna check in the skull key equals true. Double equals is checking, is asking, is checking. Is the, is the value of this variable exactly true? If that variable were keeping track of hit points, you know, my hit points, if hit points, is, if my hit points are greater than 100, you know, we've done if else a little bit before. There's nothing new. But here we're saying if the value that's inside of that variable is exactly true, then true, we have the key do the following. If it's false, if we never picked it up, skip this part and do this part. Okay, we've done that. Easy. Now, this is the way that we've done before. This is sort of the long way. This is the beginner way. But right here, uh, pro method. If we have it just like this, if is always actually technically checking for true. Every computer language, when you ask it a question, is pretty much always asking to check of true. Anything else is going to be false. So if we just write if inventory key and then proceed with the rest, that's the same as inventory key equals equals true. They're equivalent. The pro method saves you from typing a little bit extra and typing it wrong. But the pro method, if no one explains to you that it is automatically always checking for true, then it doesn't make, it seems incomplete. So this is saying, okay, let's check inside what's in that variable. Oh, it happens to be true. If what's in there is true, then it's true, do this part. Oh, what happens to be in there is false. If it is true, it's not, it's false, do the next part. So I'll leave it here the long way. I'll put it in the notes the short way. This is a this is a uh, this is the way we use the inventory system behind the scenes on screen. How does that look like? We'll do that in a moment. Um, what I need to say then here is to do create a new scene path. I don't have anywhere for it to actually go to yet. 
I don't have a uh, another you know seven screens to go into. I uh, I need to design that. I'm not going to again. This is kind of the extra credit stuff. So if you then do want to go to some other scenes and stuff, you need to then take a moment to create more scenes and more stuff to look at and more paths. That'll be a um, but this is enough for it to want to work. Um, yeah, um, I don't have any other places to go. I, I could set it, I suppose, that if I'm on the right path, I could make this go to the left path. I have a left hallway. I, could set that up to go back to the left, I guess, if I wanted to. Uh, but I would rather go make it go to some other paths. So to do eventually is make it go somewhere. And then for the false to do a, a I don't know, womp womp sound. You know, you can't go forward yet. You don't have the key yet. So you'll do that later. Uh, but let's see. If this works for the moment, also we want to add in the part of the animation. We we made the part about there's planks. I want those planks to fall off. Well, they'll fall off after we defeat the boss. We'll do that in a moment. Uh, but I just want to make sure this works so far. The logic of it. So uh, I'll do a quick test here in the simulator. It's not going to be that fast, actually, unfortunately, because now that we've started to add sound, it's going to uh, be slower and slower. Actually, I got an error here, so let me fix that. I might have accidentally typed something somewhere. So yeah, this is going to be slower. Good thing we're getting close to the end of the project because as you start to add music, your project, every time you do your tests and such now, are going to just go slower and slower, unfortunately. Let's see. So what's this error here first? So what does that say? Secret something, end of something. What does that say? Oh, um, I guess technically we don't want that semicolon there. Oh, no, here we go. I accidentally wrote the end of, yeah, this is the error. This is, I don't know how I did that. I accidentally added the uh, end of function, but then I added to the function. So whoops. Um, so see, I started to create the secret path and then I started the code and then ended the code. Whoops. And then I added code and then I ended it again. Whoops. So that's wrong there. Make sure that's not there. I'm not sure how I added it on accident. Make sure, of course, that the red line follows the beginning of the function to the end. If it if the red line only goes to this point, it says, yep, here's your function. No, there's still these parts here that I missed. So careful there. It goes like that. Start this function, end it down here. If else, let's see. Let's see. Slow. I'm running this off of my USB drive, and every time it saves, it's got to save my project with, with these musics. And then I can't test it until it saves, so we'll wait for a moment. Run that. Play without sound. Don't worry about sound. All right, so um, to go to the right hallway, I defeat the boss. If I, I have the timeline that the boss is coming at me, I can't deal with the door, so I have to defeat the boss. So let's say defeated the boss. So... There's that alternate route. I can go to the usual exit alternate route. I'm going to click on it. My output down here. Okay, secret one is running. False. We do not have the skull key yet. Okay, perfect. 
I didn't get the key. You saw I just went past it. Obviously, I didn't get the key. So I'm trying to open the door. I don't have the key, and it tells me. Okay, I'm go to the exit. Let me restart the game. Instead, I'll get the secret key. After I break in here, get the key. So remember this from a while ago. Knock that over. Pick up the key. Okay, so true. We reached the limit. The painting fell down. Get the key is running. Got the key? Yes. Now when I go to the hallway, let me defeat the boss, mini boss. Now I try to go through the door. Secret is running. True. We have the key. Okay. Obviously from here, then I would animate it so that the door opens, etc. Whatever. More importantly, I go to a new scene. I go do something. That's why I have it to do. Make it do something. The point is, the important code is there. If we've got the key, this will happen. If we don't have the key, that will happen. Now, let's say the, you start to think about all the possibilities about, okay, well, if a person is playing and they do, they never think about interacting there and they go here and then they defeat the boss and then they go here and you animate it playing a sound or it shakes, it rattles a little or something of feedback. And people think, okay, you know, I rattled the painting and then eventually it fell down. Can I rattle the door five times and then it'll fall? Obviously not. But then they might think, okay, did I miss something? Maybe I can obviously draw a keyhole there, a skull-shaped keyhole. <laughs> so then I can think, the person will think, okay, do I need something there? You obviously have to program go back. You should have the knowledge and the ability to, to program go back. We've, we've obviously learned go forward. It's exactly the same, go back. But you need to set up a way to go back if you want. Right now, the game is very linear on Rails one direction. You probably want to program back and forth on your own. That'll show me you know what you're doing and learning. But anyway, on this dead end here, okay, I cannot go back to get the key. If I programmed it to go back, then someone might go back and then find the key and then come here. Technically, then the boss will come back to life. Then you have to program it that the boss died previously, so don't make it come out again. Uh, it all adds up. But eventually, I get the key and I go forward. In this case, though, the point is also that I defeat the boss. I want those planks to fall down to also give the visual element, hey, try to interact with this. That's the point of also this, this extra animation. So I want the planks to fall off. I want the planks to fall off after I defeat the boss. So... Within our code of battling the boss function, mini boss battle one, here it is. Boss, I'm keeping track of the number of hits. Eventually, when I reach the limit, I. Boss is dead. I can slot that in at other points. I would have an if else here. If I'm re if I'm re returning to the boss and I've previously defeated it, started to set up a way about if if boss is defeated or not. But then need some if else. But anyway, for the moment, okay, boss is defeated. Remove the boss from the screen. Stop the timeline at this point. the secret door animation. Secret door has the animation of the planks falling off. That. So within the boss battle code, add a thing here. Play the animation of the secret door so that the planks fall off. And then there's a stop when they fall off. That gives the player a hint, hey, there might be something here. Then they could try to open it. If they've got the key, it will open. If they don't have the key, it'll play a sound or whatever. So we did that previously with the, uh, the front gate. Click the front gate, animate it opening. When we threw the rock at the window, we had it play the animation, make the window glass fly out. We've done this before. Some symbol, play its animation. So 
So I'll save this, I'll run it, and I'll and I'll do it. I'll battle the boss and then keep an eye out for the planks falling off. Try to interact. I, um, try to interact and then the um, the checker will check. So I won't get the key yet. Ooh, planks fell. <laughs> so then they fell off there. Um, I could further program it a little bit more in terms of uh, having a little bit of a pause when it happens. So actually, this is a good point. We're going to get to the uh, to the lab uh, to the break time in a moment. So then we'll do just one moment. So um, this is what our code is at this point. Uh, let's pause here for our first break. It's 105. We'll be back at 110. Keep adding this. Just pause my swimmer here. So at this point, behind the scenes, our code works. If we try to open the door, it's going to check first if we've got the key. Well, let's set up a way that visually, we know we've got the key or not. We're gonna set up a little visual inventory system. Now this is going to be a, a graphical asset. Uh, and then um, based on if you picked up the key or not, you're, you're gonna see a key in your inventory. Now, obviously there's a thousand ways to do this, but here's how we will set it up here. Let's say that when the game starts, when we're actually in the game, so the very first game scene, the gate, um, in my case, um, I'm going to add something after the fact. Obviously, if you were doing a, a game uh, more complete, you would have all of your ideas before you do anything on the system. That's why we had the assignment, oh, well, you're going to draw boxes about here's the paths you're going to take. There should also be like, well, here's how the interface is going to look like. Right now, I'm just drawing stuff and adding stuff to it. Uh, it's a sort of an unplanned game development to some degree, which is not the best. The best is that you did way more planning. So what I mean by this is now I want to add the ability of I've got a, I want to have a little inventory screen. The way that I'm going to do this, so in my case, the way I'm going to do this is uh, I'm going to have some kind of icon on the screen that when you tap on the icon, a little um, a little box will appear on screen. It's actually going to animate. It's going to animate onto the screen. A box will appear in my corner somewhere. And then in here will be my inventory system. And, you know, I'll have a key and I'll have the armor and I'll have the sword and I'll have whatever. But the point of this is that I'm going to kind of retrofit something that I should have planned from the very beginning. But the idea is these are the ingredients of how it works, and then you can add it, polish it later. So in my example here in my project, I have in the gate layer, I'm going to create a new layer, <clears throat> call it inventory box or whatever, to, to kind of tell you how this needs to be set up for the future. Um, uh, wherever you want the inventory box to be accessible in your game, you need to have the inventory layer. So it'll be a simple matter eventually when this is done of copy layer and paste layer wherever we need it and a little bit of code. But I'm setting it up here that on its own layer, the inventory box, the pop-up, the heads-up display, we'll call it that way, heads-up display, inventory, heads-up display, whatever, however you want to call this thing. Uh, we have 
visually something that is going to hold on to the um, graphics. Behind the scenes, it's working. The code is working. We pick up a key or not, but visually, I also want it to work. And so the way I'm going to set this up is simple version one. I'm going to have a an obvious button to click on. Polish it up, of course. But I'm going to click that button, and then the pop-up will happen. The inventory heads up display. Now, before I go any further, I at least want to start to draw something and then turn it into a symbol. We're seeing the importance of using symbols, of course. I want to turn into this, this into a symbol right away. So I'm going to call, it, instead of it just being a plain old sprite, this is going to be an inventory item. What do we call this? Inventory items. Um, box. Inventory main box. Whatever. Point of this is before I get too elaborate with what this will look like and how it will behave and such, I want to turn it to a symbol so that then I can start to make the box perfect, but make it a symbol right away. Uh, also, while I'm here, I would have gone back to it, but also while I'm here, I want to give it an instance name. Uh, this one I'm going to call it BTN inventory. I'm changing it differently than what I usually call these things, but there's going to be a button to open the inventory. Instance name, of course. Then I want to edit this so that it's an actual inventory. So from within the screen here, I'm going to double click it. See in place where it is in my game. Um, I do not recommend to try to edit it from the library here because you're not going to see anywhere where do these things line up. Uh, we're going to have a little simple animation and it's going to be placed in a certain place. But if you do it by double clicking it in the library, you're not going to see anything anywhere where it goes. So simply where you have it on screen here, double click it. And now you're going to be able to see where it is. So um, I'm going to call this here, I don't know, button, uh, button graphic. separate layer, draw the box, use the box that's built in to animate here if I want a perfect box. I want the box to appear on screen like that so you can actually look at it. This is just going to be a quick thing. Look at your inventory. You're not going to manage it. You're not going to craft the diamond thing with the thing over there and make a new recipe. You're not going to get that complex. You're just going to see, do I have, you know, do I have the, um, the one item, the, the next item, the whatever. Now, the way I'm going to do it here is um, the box here, and it will cover... Icon of the of the button. Now this is on its own layer. It's on its own layer. I'm drawing this box. I'm going to get a little fancy here as well with um,
So there's going to be one item and another item, another item, whatever. The idea is on every screen of my quest, I'm going to have this button to open my inventory. I'll make it look better later. I'm going to click that button. When that button is clicked, then the box will appear. I'm going to actually make it animate so that it appears onto the screen. I'll do that in a moment. Um, and then um, I don't have the item. The inventory will be empty, but eventually when I pick up the item, hey, I drew these, I drew the, I drew the inventory item and that's the item that's going to be on screen. Well, eventually the inventory item is going to be in my little box here. Before I picked up the item, the inventory box will be empty. When I pick up the item, the inventory item will be visible. This is still some of the setup. Um, the animation is going to be a simple frame by frame animation. But the way I will do this is this box. Well, first it's going to start that it's not on the screen visible. So I'm going to move it over to the right. You see that you can uh, obviously click it and drag it and move it. But if you want to use the arrow keys on the keyboard, you can hold down shift. After you select it, you can hold down shift on the keyboard and then the arrow keys. So I'm just going to move it over here. So it's going to appear outside. It's going to it's going to be existing in the game, but not until I click the button will it animate and it's going to move into place here. And then when it's in place, then it'll show me, oh, you've got the key or not. Well, I'm going to um, animate it F6 so that I can move it over some amount. Six, move it over some amount. You mute your device, please, Gil. This is going to move over a few frames at a time. It's going to create the illusion of a fun little animation like this. Obviously, I can tween it and do all this cool stuff. But that's going to move over. Obviously, I need um, the stop commands at the right place. Stop when it animates into the right place. Stop on that. So, as for the keys being visible and such, for these keys to be visible or not, the um, you can do it through code. I'm going to set it up here where. There will be on its own layer keys. And the final animation of it here, blank keyframe. The key right there. So obviously I've only got one one key, but let's say there's we let's say we program it that there's more than one key in this game. I just want to put keys there in my inventory. So I'll press the button, this will animate. And depending on if you've picked up the key or not, the key will be visible or not. 
so obviously here it's set up that they're visible but we need to we need it to make the decision is the key visible or not conditional statement and we have code i don't think we've used this code yet we have a way to make something visible or invisible. Um, we've done add child and remove child, which is different. That will either create a copy of something or completely remove a copy of something. Uh, what I want to do is a little different. It's, uh, it's a visible or invisible. The object will exist, like add child, but I don't want to remove child where it completely destroys it. No, I just want to hide it. We have a way to show and hide. Well, my inventory keys, in order for that to work, I need an instance name. So after the animation of my box appearing, check on my timeline here as well, I've got the, the button of the clickability visible throughout the whole time. I've got the box animating little by little by little by little. And then I've got a layer of the keys, but the keys are only visible at the very end when the box animates into view. I've got a layer where I stop at the beginning, no animation. I've got a layer where I stop the animation after it happens. So on the layer with my keys, on each of these, I need an instance name. So very easily, I'll just call this key one. Key two. And more obvious, we had keys on that other level with the randomly generated keys. Um, I guess might be slightly better here. Uh, um, SC or inventory. Yeah, we'll do inventory key one because this is in our inventory box. Inventory key one. Inventory key two. Key three. So here's our setup for our inventory. Again, this is just going to be a status inventory. It's going to show you you've got that inventory item or not. It's not going to be about rearranging them and, you know, put this one on my left hand and put this one on my right hand and put on my armor on my back and such. Of course, that can be done. Anything can be done. This is a good starting point. Um, inventory item system. So if I go back to my main view here the button which is going to be on the screen viewable we have the box that exists it's out of the view when i click that it will play the animation to make the box appear on screen and then if we've got the key or not it will show keys that symbol that needs to be a symbol of course that needs to have an instance name of course i'm calling it button inventory okay now i need the code to detect when i click that button play the animation of it moving onto the screen, and then detect if I have the key or not to display the key or not. So at this point, in my code, let's see here, in my code of this scene, at the end somewhere here, I will add click ability. So I'll borrow a little bit of the code from up here. When you click the gate, play some code, Here's the code. I'm going to borrow this little chunk, copy that. So, um, put it up in a way here so that uh, so that we can um, we can tell that this is the important part. As usual, this this. This, this, it's an ending here. That little chunk, we've seen that over and over, interact with an element. 
specifically. In this case, what's the element in question? The one with this instance name, BTN inventory. So BTN inventory, listen for a tab, run some code, FN open inventory. Find right here. Place it, note it. Then clicked button. So animate um, inventory opening. That, oops, not that, that. That object, that clickable object has been so far paused. It has an animation built in, but of course in the object we've added stop. So it doesn't animate into view, only the button is visible. So obviously here we click the button, we tell it to play, it'll play, play frames two to 10. And what's in there is that the box animates into view. On the final frame of that animation, the keys are there. Say then show hide keys as necessary. Do that one in a moment. I just want to confirm that this works so far. Save that and I'll run it. So we're setting up a button to open the inventory. The inventory itself has a little animation. The inventory has three instances of the keys. Skull key later on, I'll make a flame key and a diamond key and whatever. But I just have three copies of the same one at the moment. So I click it. Okay, here we go. So we're going to start. Okay, so from right here, we have a brand new button to interact with. It animates into view. All the keys are there, which we're getting there. If I tap it again, it just hides automatically. How does it know to do that? Technically, the way it's set up is that we've got, you know, some stops, right? So when we click it here to animate into view, we've told it to play frame one to 10. Frame 10 has a stop. Technically, when I click it here, I'm telling it to play starting from frame 10. When it gets to the final frame, it loops back to the beginning. And what's on the beginning? There's a stop there. So it kind of built in to close itself. There's a technically better way where you set up more code to... Um, get that to fully work, but technically it's working. So, okay, got a cool little inventory system that is sliding into view or however you want to animate it. You know, this is the ingredient here of having the symbol in the library, which then you can animate as you wish. So there's a button that's really ugly that I'll make it better later. See, these keys are not correct yet. And then I close it. Okay, cool. Now, obviously, or not too obviously, but you'll see obviously when I then proceed in the game, oh, my inventory heads up display is gone. Yes, unfortunately, wherever you want the, the inventory button to appear, you have to have the graphic and some of the code. So to make that fully work in a moment, we want to make sure it fully works in this screen, then we will make it work in every screen. But what's, what's going to need to happen, we're going to need to copy that whole layer to every screen of our game so that we have this thing that can actually be visible. The code, we, there's a little shortcut we will see in a moment. We're not done yet. So um, when the button is clicked, 
open the inventory and then show or hide the keys as necessary. Okay, show or hide the keys as necessary. So here we're gonna have some if statements. Three of them, because in my case, I've got three keys. Copy and paste in a moment. Well, if in the key skull, that's exactly the same as uh, when we tried to open the door. I'm doing the shortcut actually. In key skull equals true. Let me do it the same way there, just not to confuse people. Um, so that's the same way as when we try to open the hidden door, the secret door. Same thing. If in the memory we have picked up the key, true something here versus false something here. Okay, if we do have the key, what we're then going to say is um, the, the box, here's where we need instance names. Uh, okay, so the box is BTN inventory. Got dot in key one, I believe. Inside of the inventory, we have the three keys. These have an instance name in the key one. So the name of the box itself, dot, the name of the particular key, and then dot, visible, equals true. So we can sort of reach inside of a symbol that's made out of symbols and manipulate things, and we do it this way. What's the name of the big parent symbol? Inside of it is a child sim symbol or sibling or descendant symbol. Inside of that, there's a symbol, and we access it via the dot method right here. So the parent element, the si the child element, dot, and then dot visible. There's a property of visible. Everything that you can do on screen by clicking a button can also be basically done by typing code. And the code to turn something visible or invisible Visible, false, visible, true. So if I did pick up this the key, show the symbol, or else I haven't picked up the key, so hide the symbol. Copy that there, set it to false. It's running out of space there, sorry. Let me break it into multiple lines. If the inventory key, key skull item is in memory, true. Okay, show it on screen, true. Or else you don't have it yet, so hide it. In my case, just to see how this works, uh, when when we set this up back uh, on the scene title, I had inventory key skull, inventory key flame, inventory armor diamond, uh, just so that we can see this. I'm going to use those those names of things. Uh, obviously, it doesn't fully make sense just yet, but I'm going to use those names there, I'm putting them here to remind myself. So uh, there's that one, and then flame, and then armor. So I need three, three of those because I got three three keys. I'm kind of setting this up right with three keys just as a test. Um, 
So this chunk right here, I need this three times for the three items. I would need it seven times for the seven items. But this is what's going to show or not that you have an item in your inventory or not. So um, to polish this up, let's say here, and if you know, show item, then I need three copies of this in total. So I'm going to copy that chunk of code and paste it three times. And then I need to make changes, of course. Write three copies of the same code. I need to make changes now. Well, it's another kind of a key and it's another kind of a key. It's in the box and it's the key number two, the key number three. Possible keys in my inventory, heads up display. So visible true or false to one, two, three. We're checking true, did you get that key or not? True, did you get the flame key or not? True, did you get the diamond armor or not? Logic there. It fit all on the screen, but you see this is all happening in the press the button to open the inventory play the animation of the box going on screen. Then check, make three checks. Did you get that item yet? Show it or not? Did you get that item yet? Show it or not? Did you get that item yet? Show it or not? Okay, see the logic of it. Hopefully that's making sense. Behind the scenes, the code is already correct. If you pick up the key, you have it. Try to open the door, you have it. And now visually for the player, we have to do this setup, some graphical element. It's a symbol. We want to show it or not. Well, we have to click something to show it or not. And then based on if we have it or not, do we display the item in the inventory or not? Code. See, so game starts. Sorry, okay, I'm gonna click it. Oops, error there. Okay, that's fine. What's the error? Um, open inventory is running. I cannot access property method null of object. Frame three and sixty two. Okay saying there something about this if else maybe cannot have this property of no object reference main title open in the timeline frame three okay it's fine but it seems to be telling us over here move this out of the way it seems to have jumped to a line of code of error okay that will be helpful I'm trying to say here button inventory inventory key one visible false okay that's something about that it can't get into the symbol that should be correct now it it went here instead of there btn inventory in the key zero one visible false um visible false It runs the code in order that true part seem to be good if key skull true team inventory dot inventory key one visible. I spell that right, visible and then true. I think it's trying to apply a false to it doesn't it doesn't exist yet. Okay, this is kind of a weird error, but I think I know what it is. Uh, let me confirm. So what this is trying to do is it's trying to 
hide something that doesn't exist. It's technically, let me get back here. Technically, I think what it's complaining about is this. Um, this all happens at the speed of light. Uh, we're saying, okay, play the animation. 10 frames happen. On the 10th frame is when the keys exist. And we're saying hide or show the key. But technically, since it all runs it at the same time, it's saying play the animation and at the same time hide the key. Well, there's no key. It's kind of a very complex thing. This is what's happened. I set it up. I should have followed my notes. But I set it up here that the keys don't exist until frame 9. But the code is saying on frame 1, hide those keys. Well, the keys don't exist. So you get an error. The keys, you cannot hide something that doesn't exist. The keys don't exist until frame Till frame um, 10. So I guess the better way to be to do this is the keys exist from frame one. Wait, but not actually because. Are they going to be floating there in a weird way? Okay. Hmm. Well, check that. Let me check if that fixes it. Actually, it might be a different error, but let me check that. Uh, that's what it seems to, to me that that's the error, that hide the keys, but the keys don't exist until frame nine, so it gives an error. But if we put them on frame one, they're going to be visible, but we don't want them to be visible until we click. Let's see what happens here. Um, Fixed, of course, but I need to add the invisible code, visible equals false in the right place. Let's see. Okay, so it is visible here, but we can add invisible one moment. Okay, I'm going to click. It's going to animate, and then it's empty here. Okay, so yeah, so here's what we need to do. Um, symbol itself. Symbol itself, hide the keys. Is that what we want? In the symbol itself, hide the key, and then the code will show the key. That makes sense. Let's do that. So, hide keys until you get the keys. I do need them to be, I do need them to be there from frame one. So this is a little change. A, a moment ago, I had the keys that they didn't exist until the end of the animation, which makes sense. But unfortunately, computers don't always make sense. So to fix this, we want the keys, their frame to be visible from the beginning. The objects need to exist from the beginning. Obviously, we don't want them to be visible, but we want them to exist. That's when we then add the code to say on frame one of the inventory box, that key, visible, false. Second key and the third key. Exist but we don't want them to be visible until we get them. We need to be on the screen of frame one so that the code tries to interact with them. They need to be invisible. So this is in the symbol of the inventory box. Are visible there. They're going to cover your buttons, obviously put them on their own layer so that they don't conflict. 
their visibility. Now notice this is different than what we did on the other screen where on the other screen I had, I don't know, button inventory box dot inventory key. We do not want that here because we're in the symbol of the inventory. When we were back on the main gate scene, we had to say the inventory box inside of it is a key that we are turning visible or invisible. Right now, we're writing code inside the box. So we don't further specify inside the box. That'll be an error. You're already in the box. And if you tell it, get in the box, you're already in the box. It's just the name of the key, instance name, visible, false. Back on the actual scene, the code is, if you do have the key in the box, that key visible true. To be obvious, we can say hide the key until you get the keys. Note, do not add. Sorry. Because we're box already. This code exists inside the box. Let's see. To run that. So I, I mean, I'm in the, I'm at the gate. I click uh, the keys are not visible. Exactly, the keys exist, but they're not visible because the code said, um, "This moment, hide them." Now, if I click on the inventory, the box will animate. No keys. I don't have the keys yet. Clicking on the box closes itself basically. Okay, so that's working as I want so far. We do have to do this back and forth about true and false, if else, et cetera, that's common. Then now, when I go to the next part of the game, inventory is missing. That'll be a little copy and paste. And when I get into the, the house, inventory is missing. That'll be a little copy and paste. Once I pick up the key here and I open the inventory, I will see the key in the inventory then when I go to the right path, Tory button is missing. That's a little copy and paste. Then when I when I defeat the boss and the and the planks fall off and I try to open the gate or the secret door, I previously picked up the key. I can confirm it in my inventory box that we're going to copy and paste. Then I try to open it. It's going to check. Do you have the key? Yes. Proceed. If you don't, do something else. This was all the hard part. The easy part is a little copy and paste. Copy and paste is going to be like this. Since you want to put your inventory onto its own layer, we're going to copy the layer completely. That will take the layer, its name, whatever is in the layer, whatever instance names are in the layer. And when you copy and paste it, it'll paste an exact copy of the layer name, whatever symbols are in the layer, whatever instances are in the layer. So you want to right click your layer, I would right click its icon. It's easier to right to click or right click its name, but the icon, right click the icon, copy the layer. Wherever I need my inventory, I need to go to that scene and paste it. 
And I would paste it above everything, but below the action script, I would recommend to always keep your action script layer at the very top. Uh, and then so anything below that. So right click on that, paste layer. Brings a complete copy of the whole layer. More importantly, the instance names, same instance name. A main screen, same thing. Right click, paste layer. Got my inventory on my right hallway. Click paste layer, got my inventory. Now, this particular case, obviously, the inventory is going to appear and then disappear because we've got animation happening. In this case, of course, I need to add frames, F5. I need to have that inventory visible all the way until the animation stops. If it's only visible on the first frame, it's going to disappear in one frame. Same thing with my left. Oh. Layer. I need that inventory to be visible through the whole timer. So visible the whole time. Pasted the name of the layer. More importantly, it pasted the instance name. Also needs a little copy and paste. Back on the gate, the code. I only need to copy the listener. I don't need to copy and paste that whole open the inventory. As I've said previously, as a beginner, pretty much you put the code necessary on the scene necessary or the frame necessary. However, technically, as long as the code has been used one time, it stays in memory, and therefore, you don't have to redefine it or reuse it. When we go from the title to the first scene, we've loaded the open code into memory, and it's going to stay there until we remove it. We're never going to remove it. So the how to open the inventory and show hide is going to be in memory right away as soon as we start the game. We, however, need to copy and paste on every screen where the inventory is the, co the, the code of listen for that to be clicked. Because in this case, this doesn't float around in memory. The what does it mean to open the inventory floats around in memory as long as the game runs. But the listen for you to click on something doesn't. It kind of really only works on scene to scene. Well, how do you know which works scene to scene and which not? It's kind of hard to explain, but basically any functions are always floating around in memory, at least the very first time that you use it. Listener is listen at this moment for a tap. And therefore, if you don't have listeners where you need them, they're not going to fu function. So it's a simple matter of I'm going to copy the open the inventory button, only that, not the whole redefine function. I'm going to paste it into my front door code. It's at the very end anywhere. Again, you don't need that whole function definition. Just the listen for that button to be clicked. And it'll remember, oh, we previously defined that code back on scene one. I need it in the hallway. So just at the very end anywhere. On the right path, we need it at the beginning here, or... Uh, on frame one, right hall, on the left hall, I need it on frame one. Notice I'm not setting it up on the on the endings. I, I pass the game. Do I need to see the inventory? Maybe, if you want to. You can do that if you want. But I'm not going to put the inventory on the endings because I beat the game. But the point is that visually, on every screen where I want the inventory, I pasted its layer. It should be the exact instance name. And that will happen if you copy and paste the whole layer. You know, don't just copy and paste a thing, an element, an object. Copy the whole layer. And then on every layer where I want that inventory to appear, 
I have its code. Send it for the press. Save this, I'm gonna run it. Let's see if it works. As I play the game, I want to open my inventory. Before I ever pick up the keys, my inventory should be empty. Obviously, I've never picked up the keys. And say, pick up the key. My inventory now should have that one key. Regardless if I see it or not, getting the key will then let me go through the hidden path or not. So I'm starting the game. This works. That's the one I worked on for this time. In where it opens, it should be empty. I go into the first, I go into the front door. There's the inventory button, right? It's not automatic. When you play a game, all that stuff is automatic. It just works. But someone had to think about it and program it. Now for yourself, you make your game. It's not going to automatically know you want the inventory viewer on every scene until you do what we did here, copy and paste. Then it should open because the code of what does it mean to click on it was back on the gate scene. And now we just need the listener as necessary. Obviously no key yet, no break in. Let's say I don't know there's a key there, but again, I open the inventory, no inventory. I go to the right and battle the boss. Break the the panels. You don't have the key yet, so I try to open the door. Right now, the um, debugger just says we don't have the key yet. Okay, I'm gonna restart the game. Right, I don't have the inventory on the on the title screen. I don't have the inventory on the help screen. Of course, I didn't paste the those layers that layer into those scenes. Doesn't make sense. Okay, so we know it's there. Let's say I never close it, that's fine. But then I go to the next scene. Scene, okay, this time. Okay, we know we don't have the key yet, but let me get the key. Pick it up. Where did it go? It went to the inventory. Though so it appeared in the place that I didn't want it to appear first. Okay, that's annoying. But then you click and it hides it. So it does appear for a moment there. Yeah, that's annoying. Okay, uh, that would just be a little bit more polished, I guess. Why does it appear before we animate? Because we told it as soon as we click show it, but not until. Yes, why? Wow, yeah. Hmm, that's funny. Okay, I'll think about that for a moment and then we'll fix it. But anyway, okay, I got an inventory item, the key. If I go to the next. Screen, there's the boss, battle the boss. Tory item, got it. Try to open. Feedback, we have it. And then I would make them write the code to move to the other screens, which you can do on your own. But the whole point of today is that we are now using the inventory item. Behind the scenes in the code, if you've got the key, do that. Or else you don't have the key, do that. The Maybe the harder part was the graphical part because it's about showing the inventory opener, having it be interactive, showing when you do or don't have keys, that sort of thing. That's the way to polish this is, even though we've got visible or not, Yes, what we can do is make the key alpha zero. Yes, that will work. Yeah, alpha zero on frame one and then alpha 100 on frame nine, I guess. Okay. What I mean by that is, yes, when you edit the symbol itself, the keys over here, on frame one, these objects will have a
Vector effect of alpha zero. Zero on frame one after this animates. After this animates, then the keys F seven. After they animates into view, then on each of these, I have six. After they animate into view, then each of these has an alpha again of a hundred. Un, the keys are there, but they're invisible. They have an they have an alpha, they have a color effect alpha zero. And then when it animates into view, it has a um alpha of a hundred to be visible. Again, these are these behind the behind the scenes things that as you test your game. You notice the little details, the little inconsistencies. Play someone else's game, especially when it's a team effort. They have dealt with all of these possibilities, hopefully, beta tested, hopefully. But sometimes some of these tests, you can't test everything. You know, they might have a game studio of, you know, 10 people working on a game. But when the game goes out to the world, then you've got a million people playing it or whatever. And then people are going to do things. Out of those thousands of people playing, someone's going to figure out something on accident or on purpose that the testers never figured out. Those 10 people never figured it out, but then those thousand players figured out something on purpose or accident. That's why there's bugs in games, because there's only so many eyes on the game before it goes out to the world. Okay, start here. Let's see. Click. It's good so far. Let me get the key. Key. There we go. So the key doesn't mysteriously float into view until the panel appears. We can further stress about it that it also animates into view. This just appears. What about fades in? What about play a sound when you pick it up? What about play an animation when you tap it that it jumps into your inventory? Of course, all those things could be done. You can do those things. That'll just be more work, more animation and such. But even with all of the time that we spend in the summer here, there's still a hundred things literally that we can add to the game. But there's so much here that that we've created and added to the project and some more things to add, of course, that I think are very impressive, complicated. And if you get it to the point where you can eventually show it on a real device, on an Android device and show your game to, to people, that's great. And then of course, publish it to the full real world. Better. So I'm gonna go to the right. Defeat the boss, knock over the planks, check my inventory. Yep, got my item. Go through the secret path. All right, inventory system. That was today. We'll wrap up in a moment to do some lab time. I review the canvas items to see what your goals are. I want to use the lab time to practice the code, review the recordings. Remember, all of this is, is recorded. You want to go back to the live session of a particular week, watch the recording, skip around, etc. You can get the example code. Example code as a starting point or as a reference point. Today's work. When I stop the recorder here, I will upload my example code right there to week seven. You saw that it works. The logic of it was all explained in the lecture, but here's all of the code. And um, the recording will be added to Canvas a little bit later today once it finishes processing.
come back on Wednesday, we're going to add the um, character selection. So we're going to add a brand new screen before you start the game where your character, you know, one, pick this or that character or one and four characters or whatever. We're going to have a screen where you can select the character. And then now that character will be the one you play. And based on the character, based on its stats, that will affect the game somehow. We'll cover that on Wednesday. So we'll start some lab time here if you need to ask for help and such.